Today's program, Artificial Intelligence and the Acceleration of Scientific Discovery, is presented by Prasanna Balaprakash. Prasanna is a computer scientist with a joint appointment in the Mathematics and Computer Science Division and the Leadership Computing Facility at Argonne National Laboratory. His research interests span the areas of artificial intelligence, machine learning, optimization, and supercomputing. His research focuses on the development of AI methods for scientific applications. He's a recipient of the U.S. Department of Energy Early Career Award. Before joining uh, Argonne, he worked as a chief technology officer at a machine learning startup in Brussels, Belgium. He received his PhD in Brussels, where he, he was a recipient of the Marie Curie Fellowship and the Fund for Scientific Research Fellowship. Please welcome Prasanna Balaprakash. First of all, thanks for coming on, us on Sunday morning, and uh, thanks for the invite, and thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to you about uh, artificial intelligence for science, you know, what artificial intelligence can do for science. I'm pretty excited about sharing some of our research uh, that uh, enables uh, scientific discovery using artificial intelligence. And one thing that I wanted to do today is to sort of you know, demystify uh, what this is all about, AI. Okay, so with that, uh, let, me, let me begin. Uh, so, uh, throughout the human civilization, right, so, uh, we often stumble upon something or we discover, we invent something that will entirely change how we progress as a, as a society. With fire, we started settling down. Uh, we stopped roaming and started cooking food, which eventually led to uh, nutritious food and development of bigger brain. Uh, so in a sense, fire is all about automation of nutrition. So, in some sense. Okay. With, with wheel, we figured out how to move from one place to another place. The very idea that we want to move from one place to another place has a profound impact even today in our lives. Wheel is all about automation of mobility. With artificial intelligence, starting from your cell phones to all the way up to your self-driving cars, this is not about a, a topic of science fiction. This is real, and this is already here. Okay? Artificial intelligence is about automation of intelligence. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, this is about building smart systems, building intelligent systems that can solve problems. It's a very high-level idea, a high-level concepts where we want to build systems that can solve problems. Machine learning is the, the current promising approach to build, sys build such systems. It's set up, again, algorithms, ideas, and concepts, uh, which uses a lot of data to build such intelligent system. And if you have to pinpoint the one particular approach that led to this current hype in artificial intelligence is artificial neural networks. So this approach sort of you know, resembles somehow how our human brain works and has led to a lot of improvements and a lot of uh, interesting developments in the field of AI, which eventually led to this new, uh, uh, new hype in AI, so to speak. So we'll be covering this at a very high level during the talk and, uh, and talk about how these <coughs> methods and systems enable us to accelerate scientific discovery. Before getting into machine learning, before getting into artificial intelligence, let's, let's take a step back and say, how we solve problems using computers. Now consider this simple problem, addition of two numbers, right? We want to add two numbers, and we want to solve this problem using computers. So what we usually do, we look at the problem, okay, and then we come up with some logical sequence of steps, how to solve the problem. Okay, so to add two numbers, first we need to get input of those two numbers, and sum them up, and then print the sum. So this is a sequence of steps that we follow to solve this problem. Once we have this logical steps, what we do is to take that and write 
a computer program, computer code. And you can see this, it's a simple code, it's an English-like language where we translate these logical sequences, right, uh, of solving a problem into, into a computer code. And once we have the code, we can take that code and put it in, in a computer to solve this problem, right? So now you have input, now first you inject the program, and you give the input, and now that will compute the sum and give you the output, right? So this is a traditional way of solving problems in computers, starting from addition of two numbers all the way up to, you know, whatever the complicated or sophisticated problem that you can think about. This is how we solve the problem with computers, okay? What is machine learning? Okay, so machine learning gives the computers, to abil uh, computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Think about that. We need to come up with those logical steps in traditional computer programming. For machine learning, we don't need to do that. How cool is that, right? So, so how we do that, right? So here, you see this logical step here. Now, we don't give programmers an input to the computer. We give inputs and outputs. So, which means that we generate, you know, for a given problem, we know what is the input and what is the output. We have to generate a lot of them, right? So, number of them, thousands of examples, and give that to the computer. And the computer will have this sort of machine learning algorithms that learn how to associate this input to the output. And what it will give you is a program, right? So this is the fundamental difference. In the, in the traditional program, in the traditional computer science, what you get is output. You have to develop the code. You have to develop the computer program. Whereas in machine learning, the computers will develop the program. And you have to give, you, give a lot of examples for them, okay? So, if you look at the program, you know, generated in two different cases, in human generated one, in a human developed one, it's an English-like language, you know, so that's how we program the computers, and the computers will follow those instructions and perform a task. Whereas the computer generated, the one from machine learning, right, uh, most of the time we don't understand what that code means, but it can solve the problem. Okay, so that is a fundamental difference. So human generated, we can understand, computer can understand, machine learning generated code, computer can understand, but we humans sometimes understand, sometimes we don't understand, okay? So, what this is, uh, getting into machine learning, right? So, uh, if you talk about machine learning, there are different classes of approaches, okay, for, different, for solving different types of problems. Uh, this can be sort of, you know, grouped into three major uh, categories, supervised learning, uh, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. If you, if you see this, right, as a machine learning, it, it closely resembles how we humans learn in, 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 in the real world. For example, supervised learning is, is pretty much similar to how we learn from our parents, teachers, mentors, and so on and so forth. Someone there is to supervise us, right, to say what is right and what is wrong. So we learn from those kind of things. So that is called supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is something that how we learn as as, as, a, as a kid, you know, sort of self-play and trying to understand the world. I mean, we already know, you know, a chair is a chair, uh, a, 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 a table is a table, but we don't know the names, right? So as a kid, we, we sort of understand the world around us, but someone needs to come and, and label them. Okay, so this is a chair, this is a table. Then we learn how to associate the word with that particular thing that we see, right? But even before that, we know the world is made up of several objects, humans, and they have symmetries and shapes and so on and so forth, right? So that's the way that, that, that we learn without any supervision. That's called unsupervised learning, right? And reinforcement learning is, a, is, is another problem in, in which, you know, how we learn every day, right? You know, we, we perform some action and there is some reward to it. And based on the reward, we correct our actions, right? So that's a, that's a sort of you know, continuous learning. So this is called reinforcement learning. And we will be sort of, you know, talking about that uh, at, a, at a very high level in the rest of the time. So first, supervised learning. Okay, let me, let me ask this question. Why is it difficult for a computer to say that there is a cat in this picture or sending a rocket to the moon? Okay, so how many of you think saying that there is a cat in this picture is a difficult for a computer? Okay, and how about the second one? Almost nothing, okay, two, maybe three. Uh, so going by the majority, <laughs> yes, you, 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 that's that's right. You know, we can we can we can use computers to send a rocket to the moon, you know, precisely, 
you know, most of the time, right? So there are subjective failures, but, but, but you know, we can do that very well because we know the physics, we know the underlying math, we figured out how to do that. So we can write a logical sequence and let the computer take care of it. On the other hand, saying that there is a cat in this picture is really a difficult task, right? For us, we evolved in, this, in, the, in the world where we have to recognize these kind of animals and, and so on and so forth, whereas computers are evolved to do, you know, to do uh, arithmetics, to crunch numbers. So the second problem is a lot about crunching numbers. And it, computers can do that so well, and it is evolved to do that so well. Whereas saying that this is a cat, hmm, it's difficult, okay? So what is the thing that allowed us to do this is, this is there is a cat in this picture? It's our brain. So if we have to build a system that can do that, then we have to look at how our brain processes these things, right? So starting from the brain, so you know, what is brain made up of? Brain is made up of this special cells called neurons, and the neurons are connected to another other set of neurons, and how much they are connected in a sort of the you know, weights that determines uh, the functionality of the neuron. This eventually led consciousness, intelligence, and so on and so forth. But really, from a computational perspective, what is the fundamental unit is this 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 simple thing called neuron. Okay. If you like, if you look at if you look at uh, artificial neural networks, that's the, 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 the current approach that led to this new AI revolution. It's, it's sort of loosely inspired from this neuron, okay? So if you see that, uh, you have dendrites, you know, so this is the neuron, right? So the dendrites are sort of branches that comes into the cell body, and the cell body gives, you know, it's connected to other uh, parts of the neurons. And if you look at artificial neural networks, the, the basic computational unit is, is simply that. It takes inputs from nearby neurons, Performs some computation and gives the output to something, some other neurons. So, so the sort of similarity stops here, but but you know, sort of the inspiration comes from uh, from that. And this is not a new idea. This idea existed from 1950s. Okay, so the the, the whole um, uh, idea behind artificial neural networks is not new, and uh, and it, it it goes back all the way. Up to 1950, and then there is there's a lot of research in 1980s, and then there is an AI winter, and then now you know it's 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 coming back. So let's see how we can use artificial neural networks to recognize that there is a cat in this picture, okay? And you know, so we give input as a input to this neural network, artificial neural network, the cat picture, and we want to identify uh, that this is a cat. How we do that? Again, going back to this idea of supervised learning, where we have to give examples, inputs and outputs. So here we will take a lot of input output examples. So input cat, output, you know, something that says this is a cat, right? So the label. And different animals and so on and so forth, and we give that to the neural network. Then the neural network undergoes a process called training. Okay? That training results in this so-called computer code. Most of the time machine will understand, we won't understand, but that's that's the code. And then given that new program, we can give this, this cat picture and ask whether it's a cat or a dog or a horse or an elephant, okay? So this is the, the, the sort of the, the key uh, idea behind supervised learning. How does this work? So uh, to explain that, I want to, I want to go back and tell the story of how I prepared the soup uh, that was mastered by my grandmother. So it's, I call that grandmother's soup. Uh, so she, she makes this soup, it's, it's a very, very good soup, and I can, I can taste that and say whether it's made by my grandmother or not, okay? Uh, so what happened is one day I wanted to make that soup by, by myself. So what I did, it started with, uh, you know, I know the ingredients, uh, tomato, salt, pepper, and water, right? It's the right mix of it makes this, this, this particular soup. Okay, so I started with something. I, and, and I made that soup, and what happened is, you know, one day, uh, for the first time, you know, I had more tomato and little salt and so on and so forth. Since I know how, how, uh, how my grandma's soup tastes like, now I say, okay, there's more salt, more tomato, so I need to reduce that. So second time, I go and reduce those things, and then, uh, again, this time, uh, paper and water were more. So what I did is, again, went back and tried again and reduced them. And little by little, over few trials, what I managed to do is to replicate my grandma's recipe. Although my grandma doesn't agree, but, <laughs> but, but, but I did it. 
Uh, okay, so, uh, so what I'm doing here is essentially, I know the ground truth, which is my grandma's soup uh, taste, and what I'm all going to, uh, what I'm all doing is, you know, trying to, you know, do this uh, knob adjustment for the, for the ingredients, okay? The neural networks are doing the same, okay? So given these pictures, right, the first pass, the neural network will make random, random uh, predictions. You know, you give a cat, a dog, or horse, it will predict cat as a dog, when, and horse as an elephant, and so on and so forth. But you know the ground truth, right? So we know the ground truth, and what we do is go and adjust the weights of these neural network connections, the neuron connections, until it gets that right. So that's it. That's it. The whole hype behind AI is is this, it's summarized in this one slide, okay? This is how we train these networks, and this is how we make this work, okay? Uh, okay, so in order to build really into the system, what we do is build a lot of, uh, or, or build a bigger network, really large, large network. And large network means millions of knobs. So when you have millions of knobs, you have two, you, you need to have two things. The first one is you need to have more data and you have to, and you need to have more compute power if you have both of them then you go back to this this very idea that came from 1950 and hammer that around and make the system better and better okay so this is the reason why you know your netflix in, initially if you watch movies your recommendations will be bad but more you watch your recommendation gets better right the more data you throw in it has the ability to learn better right so that's that's the whole idea of having uh, are, are training this system. So, uh, so here is the state of the art uh, type of neural network. Now, let's not get into really you know nitty gritty details, but you know you give uh, human images and you can recognize you know what they are and how they are, uh, their faces, their names. If you have the training data, right training data. But what is neural network actually learning? Okay. So think of think of neural network as a number of layers, right? So at the lower layers, you know, after you train, you, if you go and inspect what's happening, is at the lower layer, you know, it's sort of trying to identify the edges. And at the, the next layer, it takes all the edges and try to put them as a sort of a textures, and then patterns, and finally shapes, and then finally, you know, shapes, like, you know, human faces and so on and so forth, right? So essentially what it is building is, is, is extracting features from the data incrementally and putting them together in a hierarchical way so that you can do this classification in, in a better way, okay? What is the cool thing about this? This is very close to how we process these images in our brain. And we got this without explicitly programming how our brain works, okay? So that makes this system very powerful, right? So, uh, uh, so again, you're going back to how or why we can do this now as opposed to 1950. Two things. First one, you know, if you, do, if you take an industry perspective, Google, Facebook, they're collecting a lot of your data so they can do better and better, okay? On the other hand, scientists, we, we are doing experiments. We are building instruments and telescopes and scientific instruments bigger than ever and trying to solve problems that are not possible uh, 20 years ago. So we are collecting a lot more data. So now we have access to really large amount of data. Second thing, we are building computers that are so massive. So Argon is going to have the first exascale supercomputer, which, is, which can perform 10 to the power of 18 operations per second, okay? So this is, this is planning to come in 21, but 2021, but what I'm, what I'm saying here is uh, the compute is getting cheaper and we are building bigger and bigger systems, okay? So, so these two things enable training really large neural networks, and that allows us to do really interesting stuff. Okay, so supervised learning has been used in many different uh, many different domains, even you know today. It's it's not a scientific topic. Uh, facial recognition: you upload your picture in Facebook, it it, it recognizes you and and tags you and so on and so forth. And speech and language, again, you know, you, you give a command to your cell phone, it recognizes that and perform operations, all the way up to healthcare and finance, it's already there, okay? And, and the key ingredient behind this, input output paths, train them for longer, or train them with a large amount of data with big compute, you are done, okay? 
what, what we are doing in scientific computing, uh, scientific discovery is uh, is a little different, although the ideas are same. So one example is this one where we use uh, uh, machine learning to accelerate subatomic particle discovery. So what you see here is this Atlas experiment, the CERN in Switzerland, and this is this is the instrument, and this is the human scale. So you see the humans here, okay? So this is that big of a machine uh, instrument where we are trying to see, you know, take two uh, atoms and collide them at almost near the speed of light so that we can go and see what is inside the nucleus, not inside the atom, inside the nucleus. What, what makes this nucleus the nucleus, right? So this is a subatomic particle that we want to detect and once they collide, you know, it gives out radiations like, like this, right? And, and imagine how much data it can produce per day and we need an automatic way to analyze those images. You know, so the more we can analyze and more we can see how the sub subatomic particles radiate from this collision, you know, this, this really improves our understanding about you know, what the nucleus is made up of and so on and so forth. And the cool thing, what we are looking for is, you know, there is a hypothesis, there is, there is a theory that we know, right? And we, we do expect some sort of uh, behaviors, radiation behaviors, but what we are looking here is, is particularly the, 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 the type of particles that does not follow any of our notions or any of our theories and hypotheses. Okay? So those are the, the sort of interesting phenomena that allows the scientists to go back to their drawing board and say, okay, so what is this? You know, this, this uh, we haven't seen, we haven't expected this, and this is something new, and that lead to new theories. That lead to new sort of um, experiments and so on and so forth. And uh, so here is another example where we are using machine learning for cosmology research. You know, universe is fascinating. You know, we always looked up sky, try to understand what's happening. And this example, we are looking at gravitational lensing. So gravitational lensing is a phenomena where, you know, we all know light travels in a straight line, right? Not, 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 not always. So what you see here, so you have one galaxy that is emitting the light and another galaxy really huge galaxy that comes in, 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 in the way that will bend the light. And Einstein predicted it long back. Uh, but now we started with a powerful telescope, we started seeing those kind of things in, um, in, in our experiments, in our, in our data collection. You see these, and what happens is, if you have two galaxies and the light bends, and as a result what you will see is one galaxy that is, uh, that is in two places. So in an image, one galaxy will be sort of reflected in two places. Uh, are more, even more. And, and what you see here is, is some examples. And you know, here is the input image. So this is the center point is the, is the power galaxy that is facing the Earth, right? The ring around that, that is a reflection of a galaxy that is behind it, okay? So the light was bent because of this huge galaxy that is in front. And as a result, what we see here is this ring. So these are all different examples of that, of that, of that ring. And this is the input that we get from the telescope. I see how noisy and how sort of irregular it is. And what we want to get there is to remove this galaxy that is facing us and see how this, this lens image look like. And this is what and this is what the lens image look like. So there are several in between processes. You see, you know, we can remove the noise, we can de-blend, so remove the source you know, that is facing us and make this you know, as clean as possible. Before it was primarily done by the domain scientists. The cosmologists, you know, they, they use you know hand draw, you know, very manually intensive process to go from here to here. Now we can do this automatically, you know, not one image, thousands of them in a second. You know, that's game game changing stuff for cosmologists. Okay, so this is another example where we are using machine learning, uh, although cosmology and 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 subparticle discovery are. You, know, you may or may not encounter in your real life, real life but traffic, yes. <laughs> okay, so I, I bet no one has escaped from this problem and what we are doing here is um, trying to model the traffic, um, the whole state of California, so that's, uh, that's something we started with. And here we are using the historical data to learn the traffic dynamics and try to predict, you know, given, given the current one hour, how the traffic will evolve for the next one hour, not one location, not uh, two locations, but throughout California. You know, that scale uh, we can do now. And uh, more importantly, how, when, when there is an incident, how this, this traffic propagates throughout this network, 
And you know, this is something that people have tried to do it with hand and, and tried to model with, with the really sophisticated uh, hypothesis and theories and so on and so forth. Now, we let the machine learning take care of it, give the data and learn that. So that's what we are, we are doing. And that's, that's a game changing, again, for transportation and proactive routing and things like that. This is another interesting project that we did for uh, Chicago. And they have several inspections and, and, and you know, elevator inspection, rodent inspection, and so on and so forth. These inspections make sure that the city runs in the way that you know, it should be. Uh, and the thing that we were looking at is the restaurant prediction. So you know, there are food safety, food safety norms and so on and so forth. And what we want to do is uh, trying from the historical data, um, can we predict which restaurant will violate the food safety conditions on a given day? So we have historical data again. We can let the machine learning learn. On a given day, we ask the machine learning give set up restaurants and say, OK, which restaurant has the highest probability of violating something today, uh, violating food norms today? And then we can send the inspectors to those restaurants and sort of prioritize the inspections. Remember, you know, they have only 10 inspectors, or an order of 10 inspectors for the whole city of Chicago. And having that sort of prioritized list sometimes can save lives. Okay? So, uh, so uh, what, what, what we found out is in using machine learning methods as, as opposed to the business as usual, we can predict violations up to a week in advance, just for, for a three months period. OK, great. So these are a few examples of uh, supervised learning. And it's not, you know, we have more than 80 plus projects at Argonne that uses you know, this sort of uh, methodologies to advance uh, scientific discovery. Um, so let's look at what unsupervised learning uh, here means. Uh, so here is another exercise. So how many of you think that there are only two images that are generated by the computer and the rest are real? OK, great. How many of you think half of that are computer generated? OK, how many of you think all are computer generated? Okay, yes. These are all computer generated ones, you know? So how we train this is, um, um, so researchers at NVIDIA, they took celebrity images and give it to the training algorithm. And then after training, they started an algorithm to generate the celebrity looking like images. Okay? And none of them are real here. Okay? These persons don't exist. Okay? Uh, and but but what we what what is the, what is the interesting thing about this is you know without explicitly telling how celebrities will look like we can just take celebrity images and train an algorithm or train a neural network and generate artificially looking celebrity images. You know, so the poem example is, is, is that. You, know, you give a lot of poems to, uh, to the computer and ask them to generate you know, new poems or, or, or music or so on and so forth. Right? So this is fascinating because unsupervised learning means that we don't have to explicitly say these are celebrities. Uh, so what we do, we use similar ideas and try to try to uh, generate molecules or uh, drugs uh, for battery research or for uh, uh, for drug discovery uh, and, and so on and so forth. You know, the idea here is very similar. We can take different types of drug-like molecules and train an algorithm and ask the algorithm to generate drug-like molecules that we cannot generate and see, you know, what are the different variations that it can come up with which doesn't exist now, but it can come up with those type of variations. Think of the celebrity images, right? And once we have that, then we can go and look at and analyze and, and, and sort of filter that out and focus on, OK, can we synthesize those drugs? Can we synthesize those materials for batteries and so on and so forth, right? So this is, again, game changing, because now computer experiments are real experiments in scientific discovery is very, very expensive as opposed to Facebook and Google data, right? You know, here. We can collect a lot of data in an industry setting, whereas in scientific experiments, to do one experiment, it might take several thousands of dollars, or it can take a month of computing hour to do simulation, even on the fastest supercomputer on the planet. Okay? We cannot have millions of different experimental data to do this type of research. So, so on the other hand, we can take the existing type of molecules and give it to the machine learning algorithm and ask them to learn about how these molecules look like and to ask them to come up with variations that we cannot come up with. Okay. Um, the third part is reinforcement learning. 
this is similar to how we learn uh, many things, right? So here you have an agent, um, an AI agent, uh, that performs an action in an environment and then gets a reward from reward for that particular action and using that action, using that reward, it performs uh, further actions. Okay? To illustrate this, consider this example. You know, this game, most of us have played this simple game. Um, what we have to do, you know, two-player game, uh, we have to move the paddle and, 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 and sort of, you know, send the ball to the open, right? And if they miss, then we score. If we miss, they score, right? Okay. If you have to solve this problem using supervised learning, let's say you know we have to build a build a computer that can play this game, what we will do, right? The supervised learning formulation is this, right? Let's hire someone and ask them to play the game, and then what we can do is for for each image we can see what the action they are doing. So seeing this image is do, pressing up button or down button, and then we can record that, right? And then collect a lot of data of inputs and outputs. And then let a neural, we train a neural network, and then and then using that code, given a given a new game, right? Given that new image, we can predict whether to go up or down, whether to move the paddle uh, up or down, right? So that's a simple supervised learning formulation for this problem. So what is the problem with this? Is first of all, you need a lot of input-output examples. You know, you have to hire someone and then do play this game and collect the data. So first of all, you know, we need large amount of data to train supervised learning algorithm. And the second thing is, you know, if you're hiring a mediocre player like me, right, <laughs> then the system that you're going to build is as good as me, right? But what we want to build is something superhuman, um, uh, something that can play better than me or, or someone else and so on and so forth, right? So that's that's where the reinforcement learning comes in. Okay, the reinforcement learning formulation is shown here where you put a neural network directly into that game and that will watch that and initially what it will do, it will make random choices, move up and then it will lose. If it loses, take the point and give that to the neural network that you are doing bad. If sometimes you know, it, can, it can do actions uh, that, are, that are better, by I you know you can you can evaluate that by looking at the score and give the score directly to the neural network by doing this right so a neural network here is an agent that performs action in the beginning it will lose a lot but slowly it will start figuring out uh, a, a strategy to increase its score okay so uh, this idea although simple it's very very powerful. Uh, Probably you might have seen this. Uh, Google uh, designed this this game, uh, this 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 system called AlphaGo that can play this game of Go. Game of Go is thousand or million times difficult than game of chess. Okay, and uh, what what they did is this this idea of you know self play. You know they let the agent to play the game of Go by itself and figure out a strategy. And then finally, what they did is they took that system and and. Uh, and, and, and put it head to head, to head with the world champion. Um, and and what, what it turns out is AlphaGo beat the world champion. So the world champion is, is like 18 times. Uh, yeah, he won 18 times the world championship. And he, it, this, this system beat the, 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 the AlphaGo champion 4-1. Okay? So that's the, the sort of the powerful uh, nature of, uh, of reinforcement learning. You know, if we can build the system right, uh, it can learn from its experience by self-play, uh, by uh, by looking at you know different types of strategies. It will take a lot of compute hours. Okay, so you know they tried it for I don't know. Uh, in terms of compute hours, it was more than like 50 years or so. But they have really huge computers, so they can parallelize everything. But the point is, we can really build such a powerful system that can build world, that can be the world champions in in that way. So far, for you know to give you a little bit of background, before this. If you take a computer that can play game of Go, if you're a sort of an average player, you can beat the computer in the game of Go because the, 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 the game itself is not uh, very easy for computers to, to play. Okay? Um, what we are doing is using that, those kind of ideas to design neural networks. Okay? So if you, you know, we were talking about neural networks throughout the talk, but coming up with the right neural network for the right type of data, that's a that's a million dollar question, right? So if you're solving a new type of problem, 
uh, usually the experts go and figure out how to build this and how to put the right type of neural network for, for this kind of thing. And, uh, and this is similar to you know, how uh, you know, the uh, Lego blocks, you know, think of Lego blocks, you want to put those Lego blocks in a proper way to build something. The building neural network is, is very empirical, there is no science behind it. And uh, usually it depends on the human expert and, and experience and so on and so forth. So what we are doing is, instead of humans, we are, I designed these networks, uh, I let the, new, the, the, the reinforcement learning to build the network for me. Here, they can make decisions how to build this network, and the reward is the accuracy of the particular task. It will, in the beginning, it will perform really bad, but you know, we have computing, we, we have computers, massive computers with which we can paralyze all these things and really build these networks real fast, automatically. Okay, so we were using that to, uh, for, for cancer drug discovery. So you know, take, uh, you know, this example is about, you, know, you, have a, you have a cancer tumor and you have drugs and what we want to figure out is you know, build a neural network model given drugs and cancer tumor uh, characteristics, we want to figure out that this drug is particularly effective on this particular uh, uh, tumor. We have a lot of data about that, so we can, we, can, we can play with that. But now we want to build this neural network automatically. And this is uh, what the, neural, uh, the, the reinforcement learning came up with. So uh, let's not go really deep into these this results, but what I want to point out is this, this yellow stuff is the one that is designed by uh, a, a domain expert, okay? He took several weeks to design the neural network for this cancer drug discovery task. And we led the reinforcement learning to automatically come up with the neural network and it came up with hundreds of different neural networks in six hours that can outperform what the humans can do, okay? What this means for cancer research? You know, we can accelerate these kind of studies to, a, to an unprecedented level. Right, so it's not anymore depends, well, in some sense it depends on humans as well, but we can, we can let computers to come up with these type of different neural networks that are better than, you know, in this, in this plot, higher the better, uh, better than what, what a human can do, okay? Okay, so I'm, I'm almost uh, towards the end of my talk. Uh, to conclude, you know, AI systems, you know, right now we use you know, these, these different classes of methods, which are pretty similar to how we humans learn uh, in real world. And if, we are, if, if you see, like, you know, if, if intelligence is a cake, you know, right, uh, then what we have as a supervised learning is just an icing. You know, that's, that's where a lot of focus is on now, but doesn't mean it's end of the road. It's pretty exciting now, but again, you know, it just, it's, it's the icing on the cake. But what the real cake is, it's the unsupervised learning and the reinforcement learning. You know, imagine a system that can figure out how to solve a task by itself. Isn't it something that we want to do? Like it's something that we aspire to build. So that's where the reinforcement or the unsupervised and the reinforcement learning is going to play a significant role. Okay, so in terms of future, there are, there are several avenues. You know, this is a one yeah, we, although we are like a multi-science lab, um, you know, in the, in the history of lab, uh, in the history of argon, there is one subject, one area that brought, the, brought all the scientists together is artificial intelligence, okay? Um, so there's, again, several, several aspects, and, and I want to just point out a couple of them. So to, you know, the AI systems that we have, machine learning that we have now, no means um, without any limitations. Uh, we can talk about that, what the limitations are and so forth and so forth. But one thing that we are looking at is to address those limitations. We are looking into how, how, how insects work. You know, can we take inspirations from insect brains? For example, take a fruit fly, Doxophilia. Right? It has an order of 10,000 uh, neurons as opposed to billions of neurons that humans have. But things that uh, fruit fly can do, we cannot do. Our, no, the state of the art AI system cannot do you know, the way that it can, it can uh, land in a particular place with that precision, it's amazing with just 10,000 neurons. It can avoid, it can process uh, heat, it can avoid imminent dangers and so on and so forth. These are the things that we were, we were looking at and see, you know, can we build uh, uh, AI system taking inspiration from insect brains as opposed to, you know, the current uh, compute heavy, uh, data heavy, uh, um, 
uh, artificial neural networks. And, and what are the use cases? You know, think of these big facilities. You know, this is urban photon source where we do you know, really ex powerful X-ray type, you know, sending X-ray into, uh, into uh, materials and see what is inside. So this is, you know, these are the size of the car, okay? So here you can't even see. But this is the size of the, those, those big uh, facilities. And uh, the way that the data is processed here, like people do experiments and then store the data and then move the data to big supercomputers and then analyze the data and figure out what's happening. But imagine if you have this kind of low powered uh, effective system just sitting on each of the sensors within those facilities, right? That's a game changing stuff to do. Uh, again, you know, Array of Things is another project from Argonne. You might have seen this in the city of Chicago where, you know, we have this sort of sensor sitting and trying to see, you know, uh, monitor the air, um, air, air quality, um, the traffic, and so on and so forth. Uh, again, you know, right now this is static. Think of this node as a sort of an intelligent node. You know, this is called AI at Edge, where, you know, if we have this kind of low-powered AI devices sitting just next to this, then we can do a lot more interesting stuff. Right? You know, detecting the air pollution, detecting the traffic well in advance, and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, we cannot, we cannot put a big supercomputer behind, behind each of the sensor, right? So we have to address this problem, and, and this, is, this is the whole fascinating area of uh, artificial intelligence at edge. I want to end the talk with this interesting study. Uh, and, and again, you know, it's going back to the game with the reinforcement learning. Um, so this is a game, you know, um, uh, that probably most of you have played. You know, you, you, you are, you are, you know, you have to control this guy, uh, you know, going into a, into a sort of a game-like environment where you have dangers and so on and so forth. Um, so this is, you know, so they let a reinforcement learning agent learn this and a human learn that game. And it turns out to be the humans can do this a lot better, you know, it doesn't need thousands of trial and error to figure out how to play this game, right? The reason is this game is, you know, it has a lot of similarity to our real world. You know, we know this thing is danger without someone telling that that is a danger. So we will try to avoid that during the game and so on and so forth. So here, AI system didn't do well uh, in terms of learning. Um, at the end, it, it figured out, but, but humans can do this with few games. Like they can learn really fast. And then what the researchers did is they started tweaking the game, changing the dynamics of the game and all the way, you know, masking, masking uh, the dangers all the way up to you know, changing the gravity. You know, gravity is not anymore like this, but it's like this, right? And they led the reinforcement learning uh, agent and humans to learn this game. Guess what? Humans completely failed. And reinforcement learning agent took the same time that it took for this game. That is fascinating, right? So. We have a lot of implicit bias and, and we know a lot about real world and, and as soon as the task is similar to that, we can sort of generalize. Uh, whereas AI system has to learn things from scratch, but it's not bad per se because, you know, if you are entering into an unknown territory, which is often the case in science, that, you know, whatever the hypothesis we have, it's based on the limited set of theory and experiments that we can afford. But what we want to take it forward is you know, this type of explorations. You know, can we use AI to generate new hypotheses, new experiments, on, and uh, which eventually led, can lead to um, uh, new type of discoveries and so on and so forth. Okay, finally, I can't wait to see AI helping us to find new batteries that can charge in, a, in, a, in, in, in seconds and can you know, put it in a self-driving car or you know, in, in a car that can drive uh, hundreds of miles, okay? Uh, I can't wait to see AI helping us to unlock the mysteries of the universe. And, 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 and I can't wait to see AI helping us to find drugs for cancer. Then I can't wait to see AI winning a Nobel Prize, okay? <laughs> wait. So acknowledgements for the funding agencies, and uh, thanks for your attention. And finally, uh, uh, here we are. Thank you.
in a good way or a bad way? <laughs> can you talk about ethics? So imagine you, you set off AI to try to solve the problem of crime and you discover that racial profiling is efficient. Um, what, do you, what do you do about those kinds of issues? Uh, it's a very, very, very important topic and uh, there's a lot of discussions on that, on that front, um, in particular uh, for, for AI. Uh, even for the restaurant example that I uh, presented, we, we saw that sort of uh, issues. So it's a, you know, so it, there are stakeholders throughout, from the data collection all the way up to the AI system development. I can talk about what we did from the AI development perspective. You know, so we know what are the things like zip code, um, uh, uh, zip, zip code um, uh, income, uh, you know, those are the things that we used initially in the, you know, average income of that particular neighborhood and so on and so forth. Right? So we used all those features in the beginning and then we figured out that, you know, there are ways to uh, sort of understand like, you know, how these features are used um, in the AI algorithm and then we, f we found out that it is actually using these kind of features. So what we, then, what we then did is go and remove them from the, from the data, you know, so we want to, we want to learn the, the, the correlations and, and, and the underlying uh, <coughs> relationships uh, without these indicators. So, so it's, um, and, and, and also from the data collection perspective, you know, there are some inspectors who are a lot more, uh, you know, strict and they can write um, violations in, in the training data. So we also made an effort to remove that sort of bias, uh, you know, either randomizing, uh, doing some randomization in the data and so on and so forth. So, um, there are there are multiple sta stakeholders, you know, starting from the data collection all the way up to the deployment and how the system being used in the production. Um, so this is a, this is a conversation that is happening, uh, uh, you know, throughout. And uh, there are a lot of things that need to be done also from the algorithm side, um, you know. Uh, so yes, you know, when I talked about limitations, you know, whatever you feed the data, it will learn from the data, and we have to make sure that that's not the case. And we can also inject uh, algorithmic specific. Um, aspects into that uh, into that learning process to make sure that these things do, do not happen. Yes. I, I gather your current experiments are all on um, when you're building the neural network, you're doing that with pieces of conventional code running on conventional microprocessors. <laughs> Uh, what is the last part? Sorry, I missed the last part. Building are, are you all looking at this question? Yeah. Are, are you all looking at building your neural network directly in the program logic arrays as opposed to conventional microprocessors? Okay. Uh, fantastic question. And it's a billion dollar industry now. Uh, so um, there are a lot of new startups and also established players uh, who are into that business um, trying to build uh, accelerator, we call that as neural network accelerators um, that either, um, you know, they, they, they sort of, you know, um, build chips that, that are uh, particularly suited for neural networks or for AI. And uh, the neuromorphic uh, stuff is, uh, neuromorphic chips is, a, is, a, is an entirely different game where um, you, you, you don't, you are start off, you slowly start moving from um, digital to analog type chips, uh, where you can do this low power stuff in a lot more efficiently as opposed to uh, digital stuff. So yeah, there are a lot of interesting things happening. Uh, new startups are coming and, and uh, even the established players like Intel, Nvidia, ARM, they are all into this business because they know that this is, this is a billion dollar market more than that, but, um, but they are into that. So uh, yes, we are also investigating a lot of uh, this emerging hardware and how we can use that for scientific uh, workloads in, because one challenge that we often face is uh, they are they are building these chips based on the commercial workloads. Let's say you know Facebook uh, doing image processing or language processing and so on and so forth. Uh, whereas what we are looking at is you know how we can pay how how to tailor that for science domains and and scientific data and so on and so forth. So so that's that's the uh, area that we uh, we come in and the startups work with us. Are trying to evaluate their chips and on, on different types of AI workloads that we have uh, in the lab. Right back here. Yeah. Uh, 
Thank you for the talk. Um, so there was a concern about general AI taking over the world at least a couple of uh, years back, uh, uh, quite a bit. But that seemed, that noise seems to have died down. Is that still a concern? And uh, can you talk more about general AI? Okay, I'm, I'm not Elon Musk, so he is very concerned about that. And uh, let me let me take a step back and, and approach this problem more from uh, a technology perspective. You know, that's you know, so that that's. That's something far-fetched. Uh, general AI um, is, you know, we can aspire to do, but what, you know, define general AI, right? So um, my take on that is, you know, for me, intelligence is not not here. Uh, intelligence is is outside. You know, it's it's a collection of brains. It's a collection of knowledge, um, and and how um, how this is collected throughout our civilization and so on and so forth. Building general AI for what? For, for solving a particular task. So if you're if you're trying to solve a particular task, why to build a general AI, right? So, um, so so there are a lot of if if and else questions. Uh, but my take on that, my personal perspective on that, is uh, uh, general AI is far fetched. And if it if it tries to do something, yeah, it may be for the language translations or you know those, those kind of you know whatever we do, right? You know, image processing. Um, language translation, self-driving cars. Do you call that as as a sort of general intelligence? For me, intelligence is also sort of related to you know, can we generate new hypotheses, new science knowledge, and and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, from that perspective, general AI is definitely overhyped, and and I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any insight considering the um, quantum exchange also at the University of Chicago and, and Argonne? Is the new quantum um, technologies, is it already having impact in AI or some or new directions? I've heard of quantum cognition actually being a new research area. Okay, so again, you know, uh, there's a lot of push from the from the government on uh, for, for quantum because again, you know, yeah, it's one area where there is a there is a competition between different countries and they are you know trying to uh, push forward and quantum is another technology um, where there is a lot of interest in in particular. Um, so one thing we need to understand, or at least for the near term, right? So quantum, we are talking about 50 qubits and, and so on and so forth. You know, it's really, really rudimentary. So think of, you know, uh, it's, it's still a lot of research that need to be done. So first thing. The second thing, I'm, uh, there are some interesting problems that the quantum computers can solve for machine learning. Uh, but in, at least for the near term, I think it's the machine learning that is going to help quantum computing. Um, so we have we are doing several several uh, several research in that area, uh, but um, again, quantum computers are, are again it's it's not a, going to be generic general purpose computers. It's going to be a specific type of computer that is going to solve specific type of problem, and those problems are probably some important problems. But doesn't mean that quantum is going to take over our conventional computing, our GPU computing, or you know whatever the the, the discussion we had on A accelerators and so on and so forth. So one challenge that we often face is how to take the data, because these are all data intensive stuff, right? So to, to represent the data and take the data from the conventional computer into the quantum computer, there is no clear road map now, or you know, we haven't figured out that. Until we figure that problem, you know, how to move the data into a quantum computer and represent this, all this data in a quantum way, uh, it's very hard to do uh, machine learning at scale on, on quantum computers. Yeah, I mean there are there are, there are several several progress and there are things expected to improve and things like that. But um, yeah, um, I mean the interesting combination is how we can use um, AI accelerators and quantum computers uh, to solve problems and things. Like that. It's not you know one is going to take over the other. You talk about algorithms and that term just is everywhere. It's sort of a two-part question. What is an algorithm, and what is the relationship between the algorithm and sort of that brute force computing that's available? Because it seems like the algorithm, without that, the rest of it is just kind of random. Uh, so algorithm, when I talk about, you know, it's, it's a, in, a, in a much broader sense. So when, I, when, when we computer scientists talk about algorithm, it means that, you know, remember that sequence of steps I introduced? That's to solve a particular problem. We call that as an algorithm. Okay, so an algorithm is is a way to solve a particular problem, a, a sequence of steps, a logical sequence of steps 
that we can take and, and solve a particular problem. It's not implementation, right? So brute force is an algorithm, right? So I, I have a million different ways to explore or a million different solutions for a particular problem, and there is only one best. Uh, a brute force algorithm for that problem is to explore all the million options and pick the best one, right? So that is one algorithm. Or I can do a smarter way to search this one million, uh, you know, one million solutions and sort of, you know, do that in, in let's say, ten steps. That's a much more intelligent algorithm, right? So uh, here, when we talk about machine learning algorithm, right? So we have a we have an algorithm that can, you know, given input and output that can try to map the relationship between the input and output, or try to find the relationship between the input and output. So we have an algorithm to do that. We don't have an algorithm that can go and process the image and try to extract the features and put them together in a, in a, in a sort of a, you know, in a hierarchical way um, to, to classify that as a cat or a dog, right? So that's a traditional way of computer programming. Here we are talking about machine learning algorithm, which is basically we have some sort of generic algorithm that can, given this input output pairs, can go and learn the relationship. So algorithm ranges, you know, it, it can it can take different different forms. Is that is that clear? Okay, great. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. You just have such great enthusiasm for your work. It's it's wonderful. <laughs> you should go and talk to high school students. <laughs> I um, did actually. You do good. Oh so, yeah, we we have this high school. Um, uh, training programs and, and, and I, I have done that. <laughs> so when you say that we don't understand how the neural network figures out, let's say, those associations, you mean, you, I mean, what, what do you see that the neural, neural network is doing? I mean, do you actually see what, what it's doing and can you not interpret what it's doing? Like, I don't understand what you mean that we don't understand what the neural network is doing. Yeah, okay. Um, again, very good question. You know, so this has this has a wide implication. You know, going back to this ethical uh, issues in, in machine learning as well. So, um, what does it mean? I don't understand. So, if if I have million knobs, right? These are all a bunch of numbers. So, given an input image, I have million numbers that can transform. You know, some mathematical function and million million numbers, right? That can transform this input image into saying this is a cat. Okay, now we don't understand means, you know, I don't understand means, how can I interpret that million numbers and say, okay, you know, this number means, you know, particular, it has a particular meaning when it is applied to this image, right? So that is, that is what I mean, uh, we don't understand. It's, it's all a bunch of numbers, you know, whereas in a computer code, you can look at this English-like program in a code and say, okay, what this code is actually doing, whereas, Whereas in, machine, in, in, in neural network, we have millions, millions of numbers that takes an input image and say, this is a cat or a dog. And interpreting that uh, is very hard. So I don't understand means, you know, your question of interpretation, you know, can I, can I interpret that? Um, in a classical way to approach this problem is machine learning, uh, you know, computer vision is, you know, they extract features, right? So they, they, you know, given a cat image, they look for whiskers, they look for some eyes and things like that. That, you know, module by module, we can take the output and see, okay, what it is doing, what it is doing, and, and then finally we can put that together to say that it's a cat. That is a lot more interpretable. Whereas here, you have millions of numbers. That's it, right? Um, so that is that is what I, I, uh, I mean, what we, we don't understand. So having said that, once we train, you know, I, if you remember the visualization we had, of you know what these neural networks are learning, right? Uh, for this particular image processing thing, we can go and visualize layer by layer. But this is after training, right? So this is this is not always the case. You know, during training we don't know how it is actually learning. But after the training, you can go and visualize and see, okay, what it has learned. You know, rather than having insights about what it is actually learning, right? So, um, I mean, I I have you know I have faced this question a number of times, but I always ask this question: um, Can you interpret your brain, your thinking, right? So you can you can say your actions, okay, fine, but how that action is coming from your brain, right? So that's uh, so so that's that's what I mean here. Yes. Thank you. 
Um, I'm, I'm kind of struggling to understand how uh, computations inside of a box can, say, come up with better solutions for cancer drugs than, than uh, we can sort of do in a lab. Like, how, how does it sort of see over the horizon of where we are now? Um, it, it must be sort of limited by the inputs that we put into it, correct? That is correct. So, um, uh, uh, whatever the model that we have is limited by the training data that, that you generate. You know, especially, in, in particular, you know, if you take a supervised learning you know, for the cancer, right? So you have a lot of data about the drugs and, and tumors. But what, what the cancer research is struggling is um, trying to understand how these drugs interact with the tumor, right? So we don't have a clear understanding of how drugs interact with the tumor. Forget about cancer. A lot of medicines that we take now, if you go and ask people about side effects, you know, how many times you see that side effects were sort of reported after you, you know, that drug was designed and, and, and came into market? Right? So, so this is not, not you know, the, no one wants to do that. The, the problem is the human body is a lot more complicated. And add to that, you know, how the drugs interact with the chemical, you know, the pathways and, 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 and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a tough problem to, to, we are still figuring out how to solve the problem. And here is another way, okay, you know, I don't need to go and, and try to understand how everything works, uh, you know, from a human perspective, but here, are, here is the data, and try to see if you can learn this relationship, right? Once we learn the relationship, how we use the model, that, that plays a significant role. It's not like we are going to use the neural network to find a drug. It's about, okay, once we have a neural network that says, okay, here are the drug combinations, and this is how it interacts with the tumor from a lot of data set, then now we can generate a lot of potential drug candidates, okay? Drug-like molecules, and then see use the model to see how it interacts with that, with that, with that drug. You know, is it good or bad, good or bad? And then from that, you can, you know, you can, you can generate millions of candidates, right? So think of the unsupervised learning. Drug-like molecules, millions of them, send it to that model, and then what you can do is this funneling approach. You know, from a million, you, 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 you sort of go down to, let's say, 100. Take that 100 leads, and then go and do the real experiment, right? So that is how these models need to be used, rather than, okay, you know, can we build a neural network that can find a drug? No, that's, that's far-fetched, right? One thing we can do is, you know, put the reinforcement learning in the pipeline and then let the reinforcement learning do the experiment and so on and so forth, but it's, it's again, far-fetched. But, but, but probably, you know, when we are talking about cancer and human subjects, human needs to be in the loop. And how we use this model play a critical role. So, that, 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 does that clarify? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for your talk and your PowerPoint presentation, which was the neatest one I've seen here. But I'm uh, wondering, uh, one of the primary qualities of human intelligence is consciousness, but you wouldn't attribute anything like consciousness or awareness to AI, would you? Um, not now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, I mean, in, in some sense, consciousness is sort of, you know, um, some sort of higher level intelligence. We, we, are, we are not, not there, uh, you know. We, what we want to do is use AI systems to solve problems, uh, rather than, you know, going back to, you know, this goes back to, you know, um, artificial general intelligence, can we build consciousness? Uh, I think it's a, it's a lot more of a philosophical question. Uh, I think as a computer scientist, I'm not, <laughs> not the right person to answer, answer that. Um, but but it's a very interesting co conversation. You know, there are a lot of lot of discussions about you know what this eventually lead to. You know, can this lead to some sort of higher level consciousness? And uh, my take on that is, if you can so if you can formulate that consciousness problem in a mathematical way, we can do it. <laughs> I think that's a hard problem. Uh, it's it's I think I think not all problems are computational problems. So whatever we are, we are looking at, they are all computational problems. You know, it's a, so you know we can compute, we can we can do things with computation. Whereas consciousness is something, um, you know, it's 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 a it's a one layer above. Uh, what we call consciousness um, is is very subjective, right? So, uh, you know, whatever the tools that we have now um, may not be adequate to to do that. But one interesting thought is. Okay, so this is something we take inspirations from brain and try to solve problems. Can we use 
neural networks to try to understand how our brain works, right? So that's another you know, neurobiological aspect to the current AI. And, and, and that thread could answer some of those questions, but, uh, but right now I, I, I don't see uh, that happening soon. I could be wrong, <laughs> by the way. Hi. Thanks so much for your talk. I was just wondering, I've heard recently about the concept of neural dust, where we're able to actually read from the brain neurological system itself and get actually readings and kind of, I guess, have some sort of an idea of the language that's going on within our brains. Is there any work or any idea of in the future possibly using this idea of this neural dust to be able to aid in advancing artificial intelligence, whether it's to help you know, to mimic more human learning experiences, to help with uncanny valleys or things like that? Uh, there are a lot of work going on in, the, in, that, in that space, you know, trying to look at how we humans learn, in, in particular in terms of you know, unsupervised learning, that's a holy grail in, in AI, right? So if we manage to solve this unsupervised learning in a way that we humans learn from our, our, our things without any labels, without any sort of you know, data collection, so, um, yes, so again, you know, this is also going back to how the insects, you know, the in insects doesn't need thousands of days to learn how to fly, right? They can fly just like that, and, and, and they do it pretty well. So, you know, for me, intelligence is not just human intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, you know it's, it's much more broader, you know, it depends on the type of problem that we want to solve and things like that. Yes, this is, this is definitely an interesting uh, topic, and there is a lot of, you know, neurobiologists coming into uh, into 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 this field and trying to use these sort of tools, uh, try to understand uh, how brain works and then take inspiration from how brain works and put it into these type of algorithms. So, uh, yes. Hi, uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Um, you. So, uh, I am a neuroscientist, um, and I'm uh, interested in uh, the way that neural networks have sort of started off being really biologically inspired. Like we talked about like the things that look like what our brain does in visual cortex and stuff. But as neural networks have developed, they've looked less and less and less like brains. Um, so I'm really interested in these neuromorphic in initiatives and I, want to, I would like to better understand what kind of insights do you think you'll actually be able to get from like a fly brain into making neural networks your better and from neural networks and how the fly brain actually works. Okay, so right now we are looking at the dorsophilia uh, brain uh, and trying to see, you know, can we um, can we use the plasticity? You know, so the plasticity of this insect insect brain is remarkable in the way that it can adapt to different tasks rather than, you know, whatever the system that we are building is, you know, we can build for one particular task, it can do really well, uh, but but when, you know, as soon as you try to generalize, it has its problem. But whereas the insect brains are are, are great um, tools because. 10,000 neurons, it can do remarkable things and, and, and we can model them, we can study them and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's the sort of the starting point. You know, neuromorphic is not sort of an established uh, field per, per se, you know, um, new things are coming and we started with the, with the fruit fly and, uh, and, and really small insects where we can manage the number of neurons, we can, we can model them with, with, with computers and use them. Um, in simulation and things like that. So that's where we started, but there's a long way to go. Uh, we need more neuroscientists into AI. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, the danger is exactly what you said. It's not anymore going to be like brain inspired. It's all going to be compute, 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 so. Okay, this will have to be our last question. Uh, my question's about autonomous vehicles. Um, in the beginning, they seemed really hyped about it and then they seem to have backed off. Um, how far off do you see this happening in urban areas? Um, th there are experiments. <laughs> it's still experiments because, um, um, so here is the problem, right? Um, it's about, about the edge cases. So, you know, if you can, you can take a car and you can, you know, you can take a self-driving car and, and put it in a, in a highway, it can, it can do reasonably well. Um, but in ur urban environments, it's a lot about the, the, the edge cases. So edge cases in the sense that unexpected events, right? So you can, you can, uh, you can, you can easily, relatively easily, you can train a system that can drive, right? But what happens if a, if a pedestrian unexpectedly comes in? Or what happens if a bicycle comes in? Or what happens if the vision system is not 
very accurate and, uh, and, and it, 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 um, it doesn't recognize a potential obstacle on your path. And, and to give you another example, there is this adversarial example uh, in, in, in machine learning or in, in neural networks. There, you, know, you, can, you can put a, uh, a sort of a nice sticker that you can, you can on, a, on a stop sign, okay? For your eyes, it will be stop sign, but you can make that stop sign at 60 miles per hour uh, by just putting a sticker on that. Uh, so, you know, so the, the, the system is brittle, right? So if you don't do these kind of things, yeah, you know, the outliers and, and unexpected cases, edge cases, that is creating a lot of, lot of challenge uh, for self-driving cars. So, I mean, if you ask, can a, can a car do, can a car drive itself now? Yes, it can, uh, provided if it doesn't have any edge cases. So handling those edge cases is becoming a lot more harder. And some of the thing is all about, you know, going back to this, this, this very idea of supervised learning. The system is as good as your training data, right? If your training data doesn't have a lot of edge cases, your system is not going to be robust. So, so that's why um, building that system is, is still a challenge. But I do, ho I do think that, uh, for example, self-driving trucks on a highway for a major portion, you know, those kind of things will probably happen uh, soon. Uh, whereas in an urban setting, uh, we have to, we, you know, there, there are a lot of things that need to be solved before we put the self-driving car in a city like Chicago. Thanks again, Prasanna. All right.